Last week I had, uh, I, was, I went to a forensics tournament Thursday afternoon and evening and subbed for Alora's class on Friday, so I had very little time late week in the office. Thursday morning I come to church with no sermon yet. And so I started praying, God, I need a sermon. That any minute now would be great because I don't have much time this week and nothing, nothing. So I went through all my sermon notes. I went through all my unfinished sermons. I went through all of the finished sermons that I had to not do because God had given me something else. Nothing, nothing, nothing. So finally, I went where I do my best thinking. I went to the bathroom. And, uh, well, <laughs> you didn't need to know that, but I heard God say, e- or, uh, Palm Sunday is the day where we prepare for Easter. I said, oh, okay, good. I can do that. Preparation. Preparation. So I started thinking about how do we prepare for Easter Sunday? Well, what, when we worship God on Easter Sunday, so how do we prepare for worship? And, I, and then I thought about the, the old Levitical priesthood and how they would have to prepare for their worship services. And so I, I start digging and I dig and I waste an hour of very little time that I had digging, looking for something. And I found Leviticus chapter 16. And I said, that's good. I wrote that down and then I moved on. And I couldn't find anything else. I said, God, if you want me to preach out of Leviticus chapter 16, you're going to have to give me more than what I've got because this isn't enough. And God said one of the favorite things I hear, I've ever heard him say, start writing. I love it when he says that because if he ever tells me to start writing or start talking, I know that what comes out is not going to be me. And so I sat down. I said, okay. I started typing and out came this. And I wanted to tell you that because if you get upset at it, it's not my fault. All right, Leviticus chapter 16. (laughs) If you're there, are you there yet? Leviticus chapter 16. We'll start in verse 1. I'm going to read to you out of the New Living Translation. There will be some changes, some differences between this and your translation, but we'll explain them in a little bit. All right, starting in verse 1. The Lord spoke to Moses after the death of Aaron's two sons, who died when they burned a different kind of fire than the Lord had commanded. Or it says in the original, a strange fire. The Lord said to Moses, warn your brother Aaron not to enter the most holy place behind the inner curtain whenever he chooses. The penalty for intrusion is death, for the ark's cover, the place of atonement, is there, and I myself am present in the cloud over the atonement cover. When Aaron enters the sanctuary area, he must follow these instructions fully. He must first bring a young bull for a sin offering and a ram for a whole burnt offering. Then he must wash his entire body and put on his linen tunic, Excuse me, and the undergarments worn next to his body. Then he must tie the linen sash around his waist and put the linen turban on his head. These are his sacred garments. The people of Israel must bring them, uh, bring him two male goats for a sin offering and a ram offering for a whole burnt offering. All right, so that's our main text for today out of Leviticus chapter 16. And I want to summarize here. First of all, you'll notice in, uh, in verse four, mine says, he, then he must wash his entire body. Does anybody have anything else there? Most translations start with the undergarments because that's where the Greek starts, or excuse me, the Hebrew. But the reason that they moved the in the New Living, they moved the washing of the body first is because at the very end of verse 5 or verse 4, it says, washing his body first, he does all these things. So rather than keep it in the order they what it was, they moved it because you know, Americans, we like it in chronological order. So they moved it up for that for that purpose. So this is the order of what the priest has to do. But before we get to the order, I want to show you something. Look in verse 1. The Lord spoke to Moses after the death of Aaron's two sons. Aaron had two sons who brought strange fire. We're not sure what that meant. Uh, most scholars agree that it was fire that did not come from under the altar because that's uh, under the sacrificial altar because that's where, what they were supposed to do. But anyway, they got consumed and died. And so this is after this occurrence, the Lord speaks to Moses in verse 2 and says, warn your brother. In other words, do you see what just happened? Now, let me tell you why. He says, warn your brother Aaron not to enter the most holy place behind the inner curtain whenever he chooses. In other words, Aaron, you got to do it right. You can't just do this whenever you want to, and you can't do it whatever way you want to. You've got to do it the right way. In fact, the penalty for doing it wrong is death. It's a big deal. And he lost two sons. As far as we know, it was only two, his only two sons. So, I mean, he was probably paying attention by now. All of Israel kind of freaked out when it happened. So this is what they're supposed to do. Rather than doing it their own way, you're supposed to first wash yourself entirely. 
Now, I know the first thing in here is to bring the ram and the bull, but they actually sacrifice them later. So you bring them into the temple. Then you wash yourself entirely. You put on special undergarments, or we could say holy underwear. <laughs> Sorry, I just, I couldn't resist. Come on. It's set up like that. All right. Then they put on their priestly garments. Okay. And then they, uh, it's not in our text, it's a little bit past that, but then they sacrifice the bull for the priest's sins, and then they sacrifice uh, the, uh, the goats for the sins of everybody else. Okay? Now, we didn't read that part, and the reason we didn't read that part, is, well, I'll tell you in a second. Don't turn there, but in Hebrews chapter 9, verse 23, I want to read this to you. That is why the earthly tent and everything in it, talking about the tabernacle, which were copies of things in heaven, had to be purified by the blood of animals. But the real things in heaven had to be purified with far better sacrifices. You see, the Old Testament way of worshiping was what we call a type or a shadow or a symbol or a metaphor for what's really going on. In fact, many people have suggested that God didn't set Jesus up to look like the tabernacle. He set the tabernacle up to look like Jesus. Jesus was first. The sacrifice of Jesus' blood for humanity was first in the plan. And then the tabernacle was made to look like it. Does that make sense? So all of these sacrifices and rules and regulations are there for us to understand better what we have today. Now, some of it has changed, okay? In fact, some of it has changed entirely. If you read the entire chapter of Hebrews chapter 9, they talk a lot about blood sacrifices and how they had to do blood sacrifices over and over again. Well, that whole part of preparation for worship was done with Jesus. And when he died on the cross, that ended animal sacrifices because it was once for all. We don't have to do that part anymore. But that wasn't the only thing they did, okay? The sacrifice of the animals was only there to cleanse the conscience of the people and to sacrifice for their sins. All the other worship still existed, okay? Just in a different form. So we remember the sacrifice of Christ in communion. All right, that's what communion is for, to remember it. But it's not sacrificing him again. You know, this is not an altar. This is a really nice wooden table, okay? And this is not blood and flesh. This is, this is, really tasty, uh, you know, uh, bread and grape juice, okay? It's really tasty. <laughs> this is not a sacrifice because that's done. Jesus Christ died once for all. That part's finished, but we still have more we have to deal with. So what I want to do is look at the remainder of what the priests had to do to prepare and use it as a lesson for us, how do we prepare to worship? Before we begin, though, I want to explain what a priest is. I read a definition of a priest. I really liked it. An authorized minister of a deity who, on behalf of a community, officiates at the altar and in other rites, acting as a mediator between the deity and man. That's a generic definition for any priest. So one definition is a mediator. Now, we have a mediator, and he is Jesus, correct? Okay, so we are not a mediator between God and man. I am not a mediator. You don't come to me to get to God, please. <laughs> you get to God on your own, all right? But the other side of that, the ones who is who officiates in the, in the worship rites, that's what we are, all of us. In fact, it says in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9, but you are not like that, for you are a chosen people. You are a kingdom of priests. We're all priests. That's really hard to say, priests. Anyway, we are all priests who officiate, okay? We officiate in the worship rites of our deity. That means that you are an official who officiates worshiping God, whatever the rites are. I remember growing up um, when I turned, oh, I was probably 15 or 16, the elders in my church asked if I would help serve communion because we passed it out, you know. And I said, oh, I, I can't do that. I'm just a kid. I'm not an elder in a church. I'm not a pastor. I'm just a kid. And I remember the elder. I loved him to death. He was a great guy. He just looked at me and said, you're saved, right? Yeah. Well, then you're a priest. <laughs> you can do this. You know, this is, this is your job. And I was like, oh, really? Never had another problem with it. In fact, I got so comfortable with it, I began to annoy that elder because um, I began to tug on his shirt sleeve and say, can I, can I talk next Sunday? I want to talk before we do communion. 
I know you're all surprised. I can't believe Micah would do that. Um, but we are all priests who officiate in the rites of worship. One rite of worship is communion. But that is just one. In fact, most of our worship rites don't even take place here. They take place here. In fact, I want to make that the next point. Well, do I want to make that the next point? I don't want to make that the next point. I want to hold that for a little bit. The next question is, that's what a priest is. You're all priests. The second question is, what is a worship service? Because if we are priests officiating at a worship rite, what is a worship service? Well, some people think it's an educational opportunity. It's like going to see a lecture. Now, I know I'm a nerd. It's okay. I like lectures. <laughs> and you guys are like, wow, I didn't know you were that bad. I am. I actually enjoyed listening to people teach about things, at least that I was interested in. I didn't like lectures on statistics or anything like that. But, you know, I, I enjoy that. And a lot of people do. They like to be taught. And, and right now, you're being taught. You're basically hearing a lecture because nobody's talking back. Except Kay. She said Jesus. Okay? So... Many people look at church as an educational opportunity. We come to church to hear the Word. Oh, well, yeah. I mean, yeah, you do come to church to hear the Word, but that better not be the reason you come. Because that is only one form of our worship rites. Other people look at church services as a, show, as a social activity. We come to church to see our friends. Because we all know each other. And, and honestly, as busy as we are, this is the only time I see a lot of you. You know, and so I enjoy the social aspect of church because, because I like, I'm a social person. I like hanging out with people. And, and this is one of the few times we can, we take out of our schedule to come together. But, but if that's why you come to church, that's not right. Some people look at church as a duty. I go to church because it is what I should do. Yeah, it's what you should do. But if you come to church because it's what you should do, you are missing something. Church is not an educational opportunity, it is not a social activity, and it is not your duty. Coming to church is a worship right, not R-I-G-H-T, R-I-T-E. It is a, gosh, how do I describe it? It's like officiating at the altar in Jerusalem. When people brought the lambs, there were prayers that had to be said, and, and they would, they were all kinds of symbols, and they would, you know, touch the horns, and they would do the stuff, I don't know, there was all kinds of stuff that they did. They would, they would throw the fire, and they would go in and sprinkle the incense, and, you know, I mean, honestly, it smelled like a big barbecue most of the time, so there was a lot of that going on too. But, there was rites that had to be done. That's what this is, without the barbecue. <laughs> okay? Except on Fellowship Sundays on, 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 uh, Father's Day, right? And we have a real barbecue. But you know, that's not what this is. This is a worship rite. It is a worship service. And so you are the priests in that service. Not me. Well, I'm a Christian too. So yes, I guess me too. But not just me. I'm the one up front talking to you now. But this is not my right, R-I-T-E, we are all here performing the rites of priests. And it's important that we remember that. Because notice in or, uh, verse 1, it's, or excuse me, verse 2, the Lord said to Moses, warn your brother. Who was Aaron? He was the priest. Warn the priests. You can't just do it like you want. You gotta do it right. Now praise the Lord, the death penalty for getting it wrong no longer exists. Amen. Because we get it wrong all the time. And God is a merciful God. But we need to understand the gravity of what we're talking about here. Coming into God's sanctuary is not a small thing. And we need to do it right. I remember hearing one time someone said, anyone who treats a holy thing like it's common hurts his, hurts his father. This is a holy thing. And when we treat it like it's just common, like it's another lecture to go and listen to, or, or, or like it's another opportunity to see our friends, or it's just one more thing that we need to make sure we do in our week. We hurt our Father. We grieve the Holy Spirit because this is a big deal, and we need to do it right. We need to prepare ourselves to come into the sanctuary of God. Now, those doors are not the doors to the sanctuary. And this is not the sanctuary. 
you are the sanctuary. So that makes it kind of difficult. How do I enter the sanctuary if I am the sanctuary? Because I can't enter myself. And it's kind of like saying entering the sanctuary is entering the presence of God. But God is omnipresent. You can't walk into a place you already are, right? So what are we talking about? How do we prepare to enter the sanctuary to worship God, to enter into his presence when he is everywhere? Well, first of all, let me tell you how you don't do it. And I've probably told you this story, but I'm going to tell it again. I had a student one time when I was a teacher who came to church one Sunday morning. He said, I was almost late. I was watching Seven. Now, if you've never seen Seven, don't. Uh, it is a grotesque horror movie. Well, it's not a horror movie. Well, I guess you call it a thriller. But it is filled with blood and hatred and violence and evil. It's about a, it's about a religious serial killer. And it, and it, and it ends terribly. It's a horrible ending. And I remember he said that, and the first thing that went through my head, well, that's a great way to get ready for church. And I thought about that. Did I get ready for church this morning? What did I do to prepare for church? Well, I didn't watch seven. <laughs> but, you know, we need to make sure that we prepare for church. Some of us, we watch another sermon on TV before we come. Some of us put on makeup. Ladies, I know you do it too. I was hoping you guys would get that. Some of us iron our clothes, others do not. Um, you know, we, all, we have all these things that we do on Sunday morning to prepare. And then when we arrive, we, we shake each other's hands, we slap each other on the back, we smile, we make the visitors welcome, we, we, we socialize with one another. And then when church begins, we try really hard to enjoy the various elements. No, no. No, that's pointless. I mean, iron your clothes. Great. You know, fine. Put on makeup. I don't care. Guys, you know, whatever. <laughs> I wouldn't recommend it. I wore makeup many times when I was on stage. Very uncomfortable. I don't know how you ladies do it. But that's not getting ready for church. And most of us get up in the morning on Sunday, and we eat our breakfast, we get dressed, have a conversation with who's ever around, and then we get in our car and we drive to church. But we have put no thought, no effort, no preparation in entering those doors and performing the rites of worship. you got to do it right. You can't do it the way you want. If we are priests, we should enter the sanctuary or enter the presence of God properly. And we're going to use Leviticus chapter 16 as our example. Step number one. Wash yourselves. Now, remember, I'm writing this not having a clue what's coming next. So I typed, step one, wash yourself. And my first thought was, God, I'm already clean. Because Jesus Christ paid the price for my sins. He washed them all the way. I'm clean. And you know what he told me? He said, Jesus washed the disciples' feet. And he told them that they were already clean. He said, you know, you're clean because I've washed you, I've given you a bath, if you will, but you still need some cleansing. You still need some cleaning inside of you. And that's what Jesus was symbolizing. Well, one of the things when he was washing the disciples' feet. I had a great phone call from a, from a friend the other day. And he was asking me some technical questions. And he said, you know, I, about the Bible, not like about computers, but he said, uh, do, do you ask for forgiveness again or not? You know, do you have to ask for forgiveness every time you sin or, or don't you? And, and I, I tried to explain to him, I think he got it, I tried to explain to him why we ask for forgiveness, because really our sins have all been forgiven. They really have. So do we have to ask for forgiveness in order to be forgiven? No, I don't believe so. You may have a different opinion, but I don't believe we do. But I still ask for forgiveness. I did it this morning. Why? Well, for three reasons. First of all, when I ask for forgiveness, it facilitates repentance. Okay? It, it makes repentance easier. If you don't confess your sin to the Lord, you haven't admitted it to yourself, and you can't repent. And you can't get over a sin if you don't repent. Remember, repent means to turn around, to turn away from. So confession aids in repentance. Another reason I like to confess my sins is because it helps restore the relationship between me and God. Because I know I'm reminded that I've been forgiven. 
And the third reason is because it helps me clear my conscience. I no longer feel guilty. I may not be guilty, but sometimes I still feel guilty for the things that I do or the things that I've done. Has anyone ever felt guilty about something they've been forgiven for? Anybody? A couple of you willing to admit it? You know, a long time ago you did something and you, and you hate the fact that you did it and the devil keeps bringing it up. And every time it brings it up, you get that thing in the pit of your stomach and you're like, oh man, why did I do that? That's guilt. Confession helps get rid of that. If you never confess it to the Lord, it's going to stay. The guilt feelings are going to stay. The guilt's not there anymore, but the feelings will stay. And so, yes, we need to confess our sins in order to help us. It doesn't help God because he's done washed them all away. But it's not going to irritate him when you come to him and confess them because he knows it's good for you. That's why John said in 1 John, confess your sins and he will be faithful and just to forgive your sins. Okay, because they're washed away, but we still need to confess them in order to help us. Now, when we talk about washing your entire body, I don't mean taking a shower, although that is advisable on a Sunday morning. You want to wash yourself, that's fine. But this is a confession of your sins to the Lord so that it can help your conscience be cleared, so that it can aid in repentance and it can restore relationship. Now, I want to say one more thing, though, before we move on from washing yourselves. Confession has included in it acceptance of forgiveness. You don't get to bring your sins to the Lord without accepting his forgiveness. Because basically what you're doing when you do that is you come before the Lord and say, look, I have dirty hands. No, you're not good enough to wash them. Now you say, oh, no, I would never say that. God's powerful enough to, why don't you believe him then? Didn't he say you were clean? If you don't accept his forgiveness, you're calling him a liar. I don't like calling God a liar. <laughs> every, let every, let God be true and every man a liar, okay? And so when we ask for forgiveness, when we confess our sins, it is important that we accept his forgiveness. Otherwise, this step didn't do you any good. Okay? You have not purified yourself. So step number one, wash your entire body. Confess your sins. Accept his forgiveness. Repent of those sins before you come to worship. Step number two, put on the proper undergarments. Now, this isn't clean underwear, although that is also advisable before you come to church on Sunday. <laughs> but this is keeping your soul in line with your spirit. Remember, your spirit's perfect. So step number two, you know, the, the, these are the steps that he listed. First, he washed himself. But that's in first, verse four. Then he puts on his linen, tun linen tunic and undergarments worn next to his body. So the first step is to get clean. Then the second step is to put on clean undergarments. That is setting your soul in line with your spirit. Let me give you an example. As I'm, as I'm preparing this, God showed me uh, Isaiah 61. So I want to read it to you here. Isaiah 61, verse 3. To appoint unto them that mount, uh, to appoint unto them that mourn in Zion, to give unto them beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. The garment of praise. I thought about that. You got to put on clean garments. You got to put on the garment of praise. Now I want to show you something interesting that God showed me when I read that. Have you ever felt down or just not good or you were tired, but you had something important to do that day, so you dressed nice in order to feel better? Anybody ever done that? A couple of you? You know, they always, most of you haven't. Okay, fine. Uh, you know, they always tell you that when you're getting ready to take tests. Dress nice before you take the test. It'll help you do better. And it does. Because when you dress nice on the outside, it helps your inside feel nicer. But it doesn't make it go away. I remember one time I was feeling ill and I still had to go to an interview for a job. And so I was like, hey, you know what? I'm just going to dress nice. So I decided to put on clothes. I didn't decide to be sick. I decided to put on clothes. Notice it says, put on the garment of praise. That's a decision for the spirit of heaviness. Sometimes you don't get to pick how you feel. Sometimes you just feel down. Sometimes it's not even the circumstances of your life. You just feel down. Maybe it's the ice cream you had the night before. <laughs> it happened to me yesterday. It was really good, though. <laughs> we put on a spirit of praise. We have to choose to do that, even if we have a spirit of heaviness. Or, excuse me, we put on the garment of praise. How do you put on the good, good undergarments, clean undergarments, to prepare yourself for entering the, the presence of the Lord? Choose to praise Him. Lord, I know I feel like garbage today and I'm mad at everyone and even you, but I'm going to praise you 
Because you're good no matter how I feel. I'm going to do it. I'm just going to. And some of you are stubborn enough to do it. I know. Some of you will make yourself praise even though you don't feel like it because you just, you know that's what you're supposed to do. I want to show you one more thing at the end of that. I didn't read the whole verse. Put on the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness that they might be called trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he might be glorified. Notice the purpose. It's the same purpose we have for gathering together on a Sunday, that he might be glorified. That's what we're here for. We have to put on a spirit of praise. That means before you leave your house on Sunday morning, you decide, I'm going to do this, and I'm going to like it. <laughs> you know, say it through your teeth if you have to. And I'm not just going to enjoy it. I am going to praise God. I am going to give him glory because that's what he deserves no matter how I feel or no matter how my life is going. Step number three, put on the priestly garments. And I stopped. Type and type, put on a priestly garment. <gasps> Nothing. So I went back to the bathroom. <laughs> and I remember asking God over and over again, how do you put on a priestly garments? How do you put on a priestly garments? And I got several ideas, and God said I could write them down, but they weren't his. The first one was, put on the right attitude. The, the, the fruits of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, kindness, gentleness, faithfulness. There's probably more always in there. Put on the attitude of a priest. The second thing I thought of was, get ready. No, I, I, no, hold on a second. God showed me first. After I said that, God said, prepare to minister, because that's what the priestly garments were. You couldn't enter the Holy of Holies without putting on the, the, the turban and the, the, the breastplate with the thingies and the rocks and the sack with rocks in it. And yeah, you got to read it. It's, it's, it's amazing. Um, all the stuff that he had to do with the little bells and thingies on his, on his tassels and everything. So he prepares to minister. So I thought, oh, oh, I know then. We need to get ready to help each other when we come to church so that when we see somebody who's down, we can lift them up. Or we see somebody who's in need, we can help them out. And God said, well, that's good. That's not what I wanted. <laughs> I said, okay, all right, all right. What then? What does it mean to prepare to minister? And he asked me a very powerful question. He says, who do you minister when you come to church? I said, me? Because I minister to the... No, he said, who do you minister to when you come to church? We worship God. We're here to minister to God. Not to each other. Not to me. We can, but we're here to minister to God. How do you prepare to minister to God? So I was like, great. Excellent. Now I have no idea what I'm supposed to do. And he said, Micah, I have paved the way for you. I have made it so easy. Have faith in me and all your sins are washed away. Have faith in my spirit and all your needs will be met. He said, I've made it so easy. The only thing you have left to do to prepare to come into my presence and minister to me is just to know what you're doing. So everything else is done. Everything else is finished. When I said it is finished on the cross, I meant it. It's finished. It's right there for you. But... I have left one small thing for you. In order to truly worship me, you have to know what you're doing. And by that, I don't mean know the steps and know how to do it. I mean understand the gravity of what it is you're doing. When I, when I was in Ellis, well, actually, I've known this guy for a long time, but he was an ex-highway patrol officer. He was one of my supervising ministers in TFC, an excellent man, just a wonderful pillar of God. And he, we were talking about his days as a, as a, as a police officer, as a highway patrol and uh, he, I don't even remember how it started, but he said, you know, one of the problems with teenage drivers is they have no idea how weird physics gets at 70 miles an hour. You know? Because they're used to walking or riding a bike. They don't know that at 70, if you slam on the brakes, you're not just going to stop. You might spin around. <laughs> you might go off into the ditch. He said, if you hit something at 70 miles an hour, it's not, a, uh, you know, well, unless you're in a Mack truck which is what happens when you hit my car if you're in a Mack truck. But, uh, you know, he says you, you fly off because physics gets weird at 70 miles an hour. The reason teenage drivers are so dangerous is because they don't understand the gravity of what they're doing. They don't understand how heavy that car is. They don't understand how powerful 70 miles an hour is. 
And the, and the inertia and the, and the momentum and all the energy that's in that car, they just don't understand it. And says, so I'm thinking about this. God says, you have to understand the gravity of what it means to come into my presence. And Ezekiel, or excuse me, um, Ecclesiastes 5.1 came into mind. I want to read it to you out of the New Living. As you enter the house of God, keep your ears open and your mouth shut. Don't be a fool who doesn't realize that mindless offerings to God are evil. Not just unhelpful, evil. When we enter into the presence of God like, Hey, here I am, God, how's it going? When we enter into the presence of God with no forethought, with no preparation, with nothing but here I am Sunday morning again, we have just committed evil. Because this is not a small deal. It's a big deal. I was ministering to a couple not too long ago. We were talking about church. I said, why don't you go to church? And they said, I don't see much point. They don't get it. They don't understand. This is a big deal. Not a big deal as in if you don't come, God's going to kill you. But when you come, this is important. It's powerful. It's 70 miles an hour in a Mack truck down the highway. And if you do it wrong, it gets weird at that speed. Because the power of God is nothing to be trifled with. And if we don't prepare to enter into God's presence, then we're going to come in and do it wrong. Now, praise God, the penalty isn't death. But let me tell you what happens when you come into God's presence and treat it as a small thing, as a simple thing, as a common thing. You get nothing out of it. How many people have said, well, I just wasn't being fed at that church, so I moved to another. And then they moved to another and another, and another, and they keep, why can't I ever be fed? Because you're not taking it seriously. Because you're not treating it as a holy thing. You're treating it as common. We need to understand the gravity of what it is we do on Sunday morning. And as I finished that statement, <laughs> God broadened my horizons. He said, Micah, do you worship on Sunday morning alone? No, Lord, I should worship every day. He said, then how much gravity should there be in everyday life? Can I tell you what I told him? I can't do that. <laughs> I can't live my life with that much gravity every day. He said, Micah, you're missing the point. I carry the weights. Haven't you learned that yet? I carry the burdens. I'm the one who lifts the heavy stuff. All you have to do is obey. All you have to do is have faith. And it's done for you. But you have to have faith. You have to believe. And you have to be obedient. That means that every day of my life, by the way, this preached to me probably more than it's preaching to you guys right now. That means every day of my life, I have to wake up in the morning and say, God, this is important. Today's important. Because today I'm going to come into your presence. Whether it be spending quiet time alone, praying to him, whether it be listening to music while I'm on the road, singing to him, whether it be reading my Bible and letting him speak to me his truths, whether it be a Sunday morning worship service or a Good Friday service, which is this Friday at 7.30, or whatever, or whether it be just going to work and treating people with love, with the love of Jesus. It's all worship, and it all has to be done understanding that you're in the presence of the Almighty God that's one problem with God coming and living inside of you. You can't get away from him now. You're always in the sanctuary. I got to pick on Tim. It's okay, Tim, can I pick on you? Okay, all right. I hate shoes. I've always hated shoes. Ever since I was a little kid, I hate wearing shoes. I always feel like someone's got my feet in a vice. So as soon as I get home, my shoes come off. Amen. Tim has no shoes on. You know why I think that's okay? Because the sanctuary of God is his home. Because it is where he lives. And the Bible says, take off your shoes in holy ground. You know, we have to understand the gravity of worship, which is life. And understand that we can't do it our own way. We can't trade it, treat it lightly. And we can't treat it wrongly. <laughs> oh, that sounded funny. Anyway, 
It almost sounded like rightly and wrongly. I'm tired. Uh, we can't treat it lightly in that we need to understand its gravity, but we can't treat it wrongly because we need to understand what is important and what is not. What is important? This. This is important. You can come in here decked out, looking purty. Mark, I know you do it every Sunday. You get purty before you come to church. <laughs> He's going to hit me later. I can see it on his face. <laughs> you know? You can, you can prepare by studying the Word and listening to a sermon. You can prepare by making sure you stand up and sit down every time you're supposed to and you sing all the right songs and say all the right prayers. But if this is off, you've done it wrong. And there's a penalty for that. So let me encourage you this morning, because it's too late, <laughs> to worship God with preparation. Palm Sunday is the day we prepare for Easter. Easter is coming. It's the highest of holy days. It's the day Jesus raised from the dead, or at least the day we celebrate it. So let me encourage you next Sunday, prepare. Get up in the morning, and before you do anything else, say, God, forgive me. Forgive me for what I've done this week. Every bad thought, every bad word, every bad action. Forgive me, Lord. Wash me clean. And then say, you know, Lord, I'm going to praise you this morning. I'm going to lift your name and sing Hosanna to you like we did this morning because, because you're worth it. No matter what, I'm going to decide to worship you. And then we meditate on what it means to come into the presence of God. And we're going to do that next Sunday morning. We're going to come in. We're going to confess our sins. We're going to praise him. And then we're going to put on our priestly garments by remembering what it means to come into his presence. But I would like you to do it before you come. And then we'll come and do it together as a group. And then I would like you to start doing that every Sunday. I remember when we were in Fredonia, and I know I'm running late on time, I need to close, but when we were in Fredonia, I noticed something interesting about Sunday school. When I went to Sunday school, my church service was so much better. I enjoyed it so much more, and I figured out why. The Sunday school time helped prepare me for the service. I know we don't have Sunday school, so you're like, well, wait, what do I do? Do it on your own. When you wake up in the morning, get up a little earlier. Spend some time reading your word. 10 minutes, 15 minutes. Pray over it. Praise God for it. My recommendation is the Psalms. You just about any Psalm. Open it up. Read it. Pray over it. Pray it to God. Praise Him. Worship Him. And then say, God, today is an important day because today I come with my brothers and sisters into your presence. Help me do it right. Be prepared to worship because it's important. Let's pray. Father, we come into your presence right now with the gravity of knowing how big you are. I guess we don't even really know, God, but we know that you're bigger than we are. Recognizing that the right to come into your presence is no small thing, and it was purchased with no small price. And we do worship you. We lay our lives down before you. We submit ourselves to you. And we give you all the glory and praise. Father, through the power of the Spirit, help us to start each day preparing for worship. In Jesus' name, amen.